Russia and Europe. And uh, what I hope to do this afternoon is just to present to you what is happening with regard to those areas and how what is happening is in concert with what we would expect from the Word of God. And uh, the most important thing probably in the title is the finger of God because God is the one control of all things. And in fact, in that regard, um, we all know, of course, about the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He wondered how great his empire would be and what would come after his, his reign. And then we come to the, the end of the Kingdom of Babylon, where on that occasion the finger of God spelt out very clearly on the wall, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And today we have the, the modern day equivalent of, you might say, Nebuchadnezzar or uh, Belshazzar. Because we have a, a ruler in Russia that is clearly going places and he has a dream and his dream is to greatly expand the territory and the, the power of Russia. So where's that all going to end? Is Putin's dream also going to end with the finger of God? And uh, from the Bible we believe very much so. I think it would be very nice, first of all, however, to, to think about our foundations. And uh, Brother Thomas wrote these words uh, 170 years ago. The future movements of Russia are predicted in the scriptures of truth. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. So we are living in fairly privileged times, aren't we? Because we are now seeing Russia uh, taking a stance on the world scene, which is pretty much in line with what Brother Thomas could see. And of course, what Brother Thomas could see, the prophets had already written before him. So we are looking at the great fulfilment of prophecy in our days. And there's no question, as you'll read from many periodicals, books, newspapers, uh, Vladimir Putin in particular is out to um, establish the new imperialism of the great Russian nation. Let me just take you back a, a hundred or so years um, to the Crimean War. Now, that occurred in 1854, and the war developed because Britain and France were most concerned about the movements of Russia way back in those times. Russia was clearly um, indicating by her troop movements, etc., that she had designs on the city of Constantinople or further territory of the Ottoman Empire. And that didn't suit Britain or France, and so they went to war against Russia in the Crimean War. And in the same time, in the 19th century, Russia was portrayed as an, opti uh, an octopus with its tentacles spreading out over Europe, but probably more particularly into the Middle East and Turkey. And so this political cartoon showed the way in which Russia was spreading its, uh, its influence. And again, here we are in the 21st century, and another cartoon we come across where once again Russia, in the personage of Vladimir Putin, is also epitomised by an octopus, and his tentacles are spreading out all over, not just the Middle East, but also into Europe. So we can expect some very significant things to happen with regard to Russia as a nation. Again, we go back a hundred years to the time of the First World War. And during that time, we had two gentlemen, Sir Mark Sykes of Great Britain and George Picot of France, and they got together to draw the map, you might say, of the new Middle East that would be the outcome of World War I. Now, what I'd like to uh, emphasise to you is that in that agreement, they had also the agreement of Russia. At that time, Russia uh, was ruled by the Tsars, and they were in, in agreement with all that Great Britain and France were up to. Now, in the agreement that was drawn up by Sykes and Pico, you'll notice that the territory that was going to be allocated to Russia was Constantinople and also eastern Turkey. They were 
going to get that territory. As it turned out, of course, in the um, revolution in Russia in 1917, when the Soviets came into power, they said they'd had nothing to do, they wanted nothing to do with Great Britain and France and their dreams of the Middle East. So they pulled out. So Russia never got the territory that she was going to get. Once again, brothers and sisters, we can see the hand of God moving in world affairs. It was premature back in 1854 for Russia to take Constantinople. It was still premature in 1917. But one day, it's going to happen. Russia will unquestionably take Constantinople. In fact, she'll take more than that. She'll take Turkey and uh, Europe in her quest for world dominion. So, very interesting times. Now, talking of 1917, we have, of course, the Russian Revolution. There was actually two revolutions. The first one in February overthrew the power base of the Tsar. And then in October, we had the communists or the, the Soviets came to power. One of the outcomes of that revolution was the, uh, the new Soviet rulership's absolute antagonism to religion, and in particular, the Russian Orthodox Church. And as far as the Bolsheviks were concerned, communism was to be the only religion. Atheism, in fact, was the official religion under Stalin. Now, the reason I want to put that on the screen today is because in the second talk today, Brother Carl will be looking at the influence of uh, the papacy and no doubt other religious organisations in Europe. And, and what we're seeing in Russia today is a full turnaround, a full 100 degree turnaround from what occurred in 1917. In 1917, effectively, religion was out. Of course, there were still religious people and they practised their religion underground. But as far as the government was concerned, religion was out. You now look at Russia today and religion is very much in. Now, we all know about the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. On the map there, apart from the territory designated in red, we have all the various nations or territories that were once under Soviet control. And there's a significant number, isn't there, of nations that exist today that were once part of the great Soviet empire. And when Vladimir Putin came to power, he considered the loss of those territories with the collapse of the Soviet system in 1991 was an absolute shame to Russia. He said the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And he meant it. And he means it. And Russia is out to regain quite a lot of the territory that she once had in the old Soviet Union days. Vladimir Putin. He was originally Premier. Then in the year 2000, he became President. And he's still president after a gap of four years. Where's he going? When you look at the way in which Vladimir Putin speaks, the way we interpret his actions through the military and other alliances with nations, he's well on the way to being the Tsar. And so we have from The Economist magazine, Russia resurgent. Now just think about what we read today in Ezekiel 38. Son of man, set thy face toward Gog, one at the top, as the Companion Bible has it, or the ASV, all that is powerful, gigantic and proud. Of the land of Magog, the prince, the ruler, one at the top of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So as we read today, unquestionably, there is something going to happen in Russia with their drive south that will bring Russia in an antagonistic way against the finger of God. And we know what the outcome will be. And now on the screen there we have Lenin, the first ruler of Soviet Russia, followed by the bloodthirsty man Stalin. And it's depicted as though they're, they're winding up Vladimir Putin. They're saying to Putin from the ghost of the past, Putin, we want you to recreate the empire we once had. And Vladimir Putin has made it very clear that he not only mourns the USSR's collapse, as we saw in the previous slide, he is, re he is so bent 
on rebuilding it and restoring the glory of Imperial Russia. In Ezekiel 38 today, we read that uh, section in verse 4, where God said, I will turn you back. Now, other versions have that portrayed more correctly from the Hebrew, I will turn you around. And that is what we read when we look at such version as the NET version. I will turn you around, says God. I will put hooks into your jaws and bring you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them fully armed, a great company with shields of different types, all of them armed with swords. This is describing a big turnaround in the fortunes of Russia. Have there in that book that's been recently produced, Vladimir Putin and Russia's imperial revival. Now, I know that there are different thoughts or different explanations as to what is meant by, I will turn you around. And I'm not saying that the one that I am presenting here has to be the only one, but I do, brothers and sisters, and young people and friends, see that phrase indicating to us that as we get towards the time of the end, well, we are in the time of the end, but as we get closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to be presented with a Russian, with, with a Russian nation that is, is in full speed ahead, you might say, with her objectives. Look at this here. I got this off the internet. Russia is being turned back. Now, look at the way Russia has been turned around. First of all, from 1917 to 1991, it was the rule of communism, the Soviet state. Then the Soviet state collapsed, USSR over and done with. And so for the next nine years, or eight and nine years, from 1991 to 1999, Russia tried her hand at the capitalist way of running the country. And so they tried to copy the West in a free market economy to a degree and to see whether it worked. Well, it didn't work. Russia may have been more open on the world scene, but as far as reforming the country, it was an absolute failure. Russia was effectively broke, totally broke at the end of that period of time. And her military was in a parlor state. The military, the Navy, the Air Force, their equipment was out of date, almost rusting, you might say, and the Western powers were gloating over the fact that this once great, powerful Soviet state was now just a shadow of what's, what it had once been. Was Russia finished? Not according to the Bible. Because, you see, in the year 2000, Vladimir Putin became president. And he was president for two terms of four years each to 2008. Then for the next four years, he put a puppet in control, the Prime Minister Medvedev. And then when his term was over in 2012, Vladimir Putin says, thanks very much for holding the fort. I'll have it back again. Only this time round, he became president for six years. And when those six years run out, the constitution will allow him to be president for another six years beyond that. So theoretically, brothers and sisters, Vladimir Putin can stay in the job until 2024. And uh, who knows what will happen? I mean, it could be that when he gets close to that period of time, should our Lord not have returned by then, the constitution may be amended again and he can come in for a third term of six years. You know, anything's possible in the Russian system. Here's a comment made by Charles Moore, editor of The Spectator, etc. Lessons from the 30s show us why we can't appease Vladimir, just as countries found to their shock horror, they could not appease Hitler. They thought they could appease him, but it didn't work. Russia's leader is toying with the West and shows all the traits of a dictator on the march. A comment from The Guardian just a couple of months ago. Putin is not alone in thinking the way he does. Any successor is likely to have similar views. We have to deal with Russia as it is, not spin fantasies about what it would be like without Putin. Now, I thought that was a very telling comment because some people are saying, well, you know, if only we could get on top of Vladimir Putin to try and reform him, reform him and, and get him to cooperate with the West, then everything would be fine. But this uh, observer writing in The Guardian said, we're fooling ourselves if we think 
just by getting rid of Vladimir Putin, we can solve the antagonism that has uh, been developing in Russia. He says any successor to Putin is going to definitely be in the same stand. So you get rid of Putin, and before you know it, you will have the same problem. Russia is on the move. Now let's have a look at a few things that Russia has done in recent years. In 2008, Russia invaded a territory part of Georgia called South Ossetia. And uh, they just moved in, in a lightning raid, a blitzkrieg sort of raid, like the, the Nazis did against Poland in, in 1939. And effectively, Russia has taken over that chunk of territory. She has violated national law, national way of doing things, or international law, I should say. And Russia's just said, well, you know, we've got a lot of our citizens living in that area, and we're entitled to move in and take South Ossetia. And so they're there. Then we have, three years ago, Russia invaded and annexes Crimea. On the left-hand side top, we have a political cartoon of Ukraine, uh, symbolised by that individual, sort of getting away from the influence of the Soviet system. And just when Ukraine thought they could move towards the West, suddenly from the grave of Lenin and the grave of Stalin, a hand comes up and says, "Ah, oh, no, you don't. And Russia has proven to be a very formidable enemy. And uh, whilst at this stage Russia hasn't taken over Ukraine, um, it could happen any day. It's on the cards. And, you know, the Russian people themselves are very proud of what Vladimir Putin has done for their country. Down the bottom there, we have uh, a photograph of people in Moscow attending a concert to celebrate the third anniversary of... Crimea being back in the Russian fold. So that's what the Russian people think. They themselves as citizens are happy with the way that Vladimir Putin is putting Russia as a nation back on the map. And then we have Syria. Syria represents one of the two pillars of Russia's strategy in the Middle East, the other one being, of course, Iran. Now, Syria already has agreed to allow Russia to have naval and air bases in Syria. And that deal was only ratified uh, just on a month ago. And the, the deal is that Russia can have those bases for 49 years with extensions of 25 years being allowed. So this, uh, this influence of Russia in Syria is very, very strong. And it demonstrates the revival. I will turn you around, says Ezekiel. I'll turn you around. And Russia is well and truly back in the Middle East, symbolised there by the Russian bear. And uh, that photo of Russia, of Vladimir Putin representing Russia, striding across the territory of the Middle East tells us everything, doesn't it? That picture tells us a thousand words of what Russia is up to in the Middle East. Now, in the last few weeks, there's been something even more dramatic. You see, in the southwest area, of Syria, uh, a truce has been called between uh, Assad, who is the president of Syria, against the government forces and uh, the rebels. The rebels and, and uh, the government forces have come to some sort of truce in southwestern Syria. Now, part of that deal, which incidentally was negotiated between Russia, the USA and Jordan, part of that deal is that Russia is allowed to bring military police forces right down so close to the Israeli border that it's not funny. In fact, the Russian forces are so close now that Netanyahu told Vladimir Putin, either we coordinate, in other words, either we tell each other what we're up to down in this territory, or we're going to come into conflict. Um, and in particular, Russia is now in the area of Konitra there, You'll see it there on the map of Syria, right up against the border of Israeli-held territory of the Golan Heights. So the Russian army are taking up positions in Konitra, and that's just five kilometres from Israel's border and the, the Israeli Defence Forces. Now, this is the thing that really is alarming on the world stage point of view. Israel actually complained to the USA and Russia that she was not happy 
with allowing Russian forces to be brought right up against her border. But they took no notice. Even President Trump, for all his amazing ability to sort of stir the pot, he took no notice. And only recently Vladimir Putin um, has been shown by America that they're virtually allowing Vladimir Putin to do what he likes in Syria. Effectively, the Americans have almost pulled out. What is more ominous, I suppose, in some respects for Israel is this. The understandings, bottom paragraph, included a clause explicitly providing for the withdrawal of Iranian and pro-Iranian forces, including Hezbollah. Well, as it turned out, the Syrian and the Iranian forces moved out to allow the Russians to sort of control the border, but an elite Hezbollah unit has not left that territory. So Hezbollah is one of a number of uh, forces in the Middle East that have sworn, effectively, to destroy the nation of Israel. And now the Hezbollah forces are right up against the border of Israel, five kilometres away, effectively. Now that's significant, brothers and sisters. Never before have, for a start, Russian forces been in the Middle East so close to the state of Israel. But now Hezbollah is there as well. And what's Israel going to do about it? You know, in old times, whenever Hezbollah or the Iranian forces or whoever was against Israel came up close against Israel's border, Israel would send their, their aircraft out and, and destroy them, destroy the, the bombs, destroy the forces. But, you know, Israel has to tread very carefully now. What's he going to do? Because... If Israel takes strong action against Hezbollah in that area, then it's quite likely that Israel will also hit and destroy Russian material. You see how dangerous it is for Israel. So you see, effectively, Israel is being squeezed. And what are you going to do about it? Well, we, we, we wait to see. We know, of course, in the end, as we read in Ezekiel 38, that Russia is going to invade Israel. Whether it comes about because she's so close to Israel now, who knows? We don't know exactly, but there is a time coming when Russia is going to invade Israel. And the fact that they have forces so close speaks uh, volumes of what Vladimir Putin is up to in the Middle East. And then we come to Libya. Libya is also known in Ezekiel 38 as being associated with Gog, a Russian base in Libya. According to Debka Files military and intelligence sources, President Putin began to envision a second Mediterranean base on the coast of Benghazi, which is in uh, Libya, um, as, as a backup, you might say, or in association with the existing bases that Israel has got in Syria. So there you have it on the map. You have the bases that, Israel, that Russia already has in Syria. Now she's also going to establish, presumably, a base in Libya. And Israel is sort of like the meat and the sandwich between those two territories. So we can see, can't we, that the Ezekiel 38 scenario is developing very rapidly. The Middle East is shaping up into a situation that we would expect to happen from our understanding of Bible prophecy. I'd like you to notice these words once again from Brother Thomas. Gog is styled the prince of Rosh, Mosque and Tubal. That is, autocrat of the Russians, Muscovites and Siberians, or of all the Russias, as Brother Thomas describes it. But he is also styled Gog of the land of Magog as well. It affirms that he is sovereign of Magog as well as prince of all the Russias, Magog being a description of Central Europe. Whoever reads Ezekiel can hardly entertain a doubt that Gog is the name of a sovereign and Mago, that of his people. And then in the Guardian uh, three months ago, Putin, an autocrat with the consent of the government. And Brother Thomas uses the phrase autocrat um, 170 years ago. And we're back into that era again, aren't we? Now, brothers and sisters and friends, let me just say this, that um, I I'm not saying that Vladimir Putin is go, go. None of us can say that. We don't know what lies in the future. God rules in the kingdoms of men. But Vladimir Putin has, has all the indications, all the signs of being 
the type of person that we would expect going to be. So, you know, it, it, in a way it's good for us to see what Vladimir Putin doing, is doing because it, it shows to us that relatively quickly a personality can, can come on the world stage and change the whole dynamics of the world in a very short time. So whether it's Vladimir Putin or a successor, it doesn't matter. They're all going to do the same thing. Now concerning Great Britain, Brother Thomas was queried whether Britain would be one of the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's image, that is, part of the image empire that was made up of nations in Europe and, and the Middle East. Now, Brother Thomas said, 170 years ago, I have not named Britain, although the island was part of the Roman dominion. Existing theories require Britain to be counted in, but I have nothing to do with them, he says. He considered that the Bible was clear, particularly from Ezekiel 38, that Britain being the merchants of Tarshish, or one of the merchants of Tarshish, would not be part of the image of Daniel 2. And we've seen the hand of God in the affairs of Great Britain, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. Well, last year, um, May, the Prime Minister, um, headed for an election landslide. Sorry, that's when they, they pulled out of the EU and then subsequent to that they had the election. And everyone thought at the time that uh, May would, would have no problem just romping it in, becoming Prime Minister again for another six years. And yet to the shock horror of many people, uh, the Prime Minister only just scraped in by the skin of her teeth. In fact, she would not be Prime Minister today were it not for the fact that she got support from a small splinter group in Northern Ireland who had a few seats in Parliament, but those seats were enough to give May the majority to hang on to her position. And hence the, the headline on the right, May clings on to save the EU exit. Now, OK, she's only just there, and who knows what will happen to her position, but the fact is, brothers and sisters, Great Britain is out of the EU come two years' time, and uh, my belief is, based on the Bible prophecy, is that Great Britain will stay up and she will become quite independent of the EU, as we would expect. It's the EU countries that are spoken of in Ezekiel 38 that will be part of the confederation of powers uh, that Russia controls. Now, talking about the EU, recently there was an election in France. There were two contenders. There was the National Front leader, Marine Le Pen, and there was Emmanuel Macron. And, you know, what's again? It was touch and go as to who's going to become the new leader. Now, let me say this. If, if Marine Le Pen had have got in, one of her big platforms was that she would take France out of the EU. She made no secret of that fact. She wanted France out of the EU. So one contender for the, for the primacy was saying, we're going to get out of the EU. Against her was a young man, hardly known by anyone, Emmanuel Macron. His view was, no, we've got to become stronger in our alliance with the EU. So who won? Emmanuel Macron. And, you know, he's got a very special relationship with Angela Merkel in Germany. And Angela is a strong leader in Europe. So effectively, we have now got in Europe two leaders, hand in glove, walking together, to establish even more a stronger EU grouping of powers, exactly as we would expect. Eventually, the EU is going to be in concert with Russia to invade the Middle East. Now, whether it's a, a takeover by Russia of the EU or whether it is a gentleman's agreement, it doesn't really matter. Ezekiel 38 makes it clear that Russia and Europe are going to be together. And uh, there's a photo down there on the bottom right where the new, uh, president, the new Prime Minister of France immediately met uh, Angela Merkel almost the same day, I think it was the day after, he made sure that he met the great leader of Germany. Now, what is the EU's position with the UK? Now, remember our title, Russia's Dream and Europe's Destiny, Decided by the Finger of God. God rules in the kingdoms of men. Well, there's an article in the 
Australian a couple of months ago. Ungrateful Europeans are out to punish the UK. The Eurocrats in Brussels are extremely angry over Britain's withdrawal from the EU. They are incredibly angry. And Michael Sexton, who is uh, the Solicitor General for the New South Wales Government, wrote this. There is something extraordinary about Britain receiving moral lectures from the French and Germans, that is Macron and Merkel, when it is little more than 70 years, a span of less than one lifetime, since the Germans murdered a significant portion of the European population and France only survived as a nation because it was saved by the British and the Americans. And I thought there was a, a brilliant article because it's showing to us that those countries in Europe um, couldn't care two hoots about what happened in the past. Yes, Germany was defeated, France was saved, but so what? If Britain wants to pull out of the EU, that's her decision. Well, we're going to make her pay and she's going to suffer because of what she's done to us. Now we come to Mr Trump. <coughs> Mr Trump recently flew to Europe and uh, met the EU foreign ministers, prime ministers, presidents um, in Europe to discuss NATO, amongst other things. And one of the things that Trump said to them was this. The United States has been treated very, very unfairly by many countries over the years, and that's going to stop. What he meant was that the USA is sick of paying for the defence of Europe when the countries that make up Europe are not putting in their fair share. They're not pulling their weight. And he said to them, well, if you don't pull your weight, if you don't throw money into this system, then we're not going to support you. Now, to date, Mr Trump has not said to them, I will not support you in a, in a military battle, but he's making it very clear that he's not happy with Europe. And Mr Trump is so volatile in what he does that you can never be sure what he will do under any given circumstance. In fact, here's an article written by the former World Bank president, Sir James Wilson. He's a Jewish man, by the way, as we would expect in the World Bank. He wrote, when you listen to President Trump, so many of the things that were said or believed previously, that is, are being challenged. Whether to look at questions of whether the US, in terms of military power, enters areas or doesn't. Now, effectively, what Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Uh, Wolfenson was saying was this: Look, in the past, there was no doubt whatsoever that if, it, that if Europe got attacked by Russia, then the U.S. forces would respond straight away, because that's part of the NATO agreement. In other words, if one country of NATO is attacked, then all the other NATO powers are obliged to respond and to help that power that's being attacked. Well, that was in the past. But Mr Wolfenson is saying, well, you know, we don't really know. And in some respects, brothers and sisters, I think we've got a pretty clear idea as to what Mr Trump would do. Here's some other comments. This first one is by the Canadian Foreign Minister. The fact that our friend and ally, USA, has come to question the very worth of its mantle of global leadership puts into sharper focus the need for the rest of us to set our own clear and sovereign course. And then Angela Merkel uh, recently said, Europe must be ready to look after itself. And uh, the TV presenter says, Merkel says Europe can no longer rely on its allies. Now, what does this mean on the world stage? What it means is this, brothers and sisters. If Ezekiel 38 is correct, and we believe it's correct, then we're going to expect a situation to develop whereby... On one hand, you'll have a very strong Russian influence in Europe. You'll have Russia being associated with Western Europe. And you'll have the Tarshish powers, of which the USA would be associated, on the other side. So the fact that Mr Trump is not very forthright in saying, we will defend Europe, what's Europe going to do? As Angela Merkel says, we've got to plot our own course. What's their own course? Well, first of all, they're going to really work together to establish a strong EU. But what's the other course you can take? The best course of action you can take is to say to Russia, is to say to Vladimir Putin, you know, 
I think it's about time we sat down and discussed our future. That's going to happen. Discuss our future. So the fact that Trump is not so forthright in guaranteeing the security of the world means that Europe is now forced to look after itself and to take whatever steps are necessary to safeguard her future. And that will include working in with Russia. So where is Russia's next step? Will it be against the Baltic states? Will it be the rest of Ukraine? Will it be in Turkey? Well, we know in Daniel 11, Turkey's going to cop it. But with regard to Europe, I want you to have a look at these Baltic states. They are the nations of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. And Putin said he has no further designs on Ukrainian territory. But he said, as a bit of a rider, we are going to stand up for the millions of ethnic Russians on historic, historic Russian lands. What are historic Russian lands? The lands that they owned and occupied prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So, look at those nations, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, all the stand nations on the right. And look at the percentage of Russian um, citizens or ethnic Russians living in those territories. And in particular, look at Estonia and Latvia. 25% or more of the population is made up of ethnic Russian people. I think the time is coming when Russia will just steamroll those countries. And brothers and sisters, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are members of NATO. So theoretically, if Russia were to invade those countries, theoretically, the rest of Europe and the USA and Great Britain are obliged to come to the defence of those nations under the NATO agreement. Do you think it's going to happen? You put yourself in the position of Emmanuel Macron or Angela Merkel or Donald Trump or Mrs May in Great Britain. If Russia moves her forces into those small satellite Baltic states, do you think those powers are going to take on Russia over those states? I doubt it. I very much doubt it. And so those states are sitting ducks now for a Russian takeover. Of course, none of us were around, or I should, should correct that, there were some of us around in 1938, when uh, Hitler agreed with Great Britain uh, that she could take a chunk of uh, Czechoslovakia, known as the Sudetenland territory, because that Sudetenland area of Czechoslovakia was made up of, of German-speaking people. So Hitler said to Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, you give me this chunk of territory in Czechoslovakia and that will be my last territorial demand. My last demand, he said. Well, we all know what happened a year later. We had World War II. And now we have Russia saying that I've got no designs on recapturing former territory. However, I am concerned about Russian people living in those territories. Well, you only need to think about what happened in 1938 to realise what could happen in our time. A study by the RAND Corporation, a think tank for the US Congress, said that Russia could defeat Estonia and Latvia in just 60 hours. And a NATO commander said, we don't want a conflict, but we have a neighbour who is not acting in a predictable way and it concerns us. It concerns them all right, but what are they going to do if Russia does invade? Are they going to say to President Trump, we want you to press the button or give us the authority to take on the Russian army? A full-scale war. I can't see it happening, brothers and sisters. I'm not a prophet. It may happen, but I really would be surprised if the nations take on Russia. So we have that incredibly accurate statement in Ezekiel 38, where Russia, or Gog, is told, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company, that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. So Ezekiel could see the situation whereby Russia would be a guard, putting its arms around the other powers mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Magog, Goma, Iran, Libya. It, it's, all, it's all stacking up. Russia is making its presence known in all those areas. And it's like 
just in the, at the end of the Second World War. It's like Russia grabbing hold of the Iron Curtain once again, as depicted in that cartoon, and dragging the Iron Curtain across Europe in particular, and saying to them, you'd be better served by coming under our umbrella. We will look after you. Let's just go and look at what's happening in Russia with regard to religion. As the writer there says, we've got to understand that Russia is an orthodox Christian nation. So is Ukraine. In fact, the birthplace of Russia, the birthplace of Russian Orthodox religion is in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. That is where the Russian nation, that is where the Russian religion all started. So you can understand why Putin would love to grab Ukraine. He is a very religious man himself. And he would love to have the territory that once belonged to the Soviet Union. He would love to have the territory that that resembles everything that he stands for, the Christian Orthodox religion. He converted, uh, well, I don't know whether he converted, but maybe he was an Orthodox believer all his life, but he's certainly a strong Orthodox believer now. In, in Moscow only recently, there was a dedication of a new statue of St. Vladimir. Now, St. Vladimir was the one who converted the, the residents of Kiev and they all became Christians. So he is honoured, venerated by the Russian and the Ukrainian people. He brought Christianity to their nation. Now they've got this statue in Moscow, a brilliant statue dedicated to St. Vladimir. And there we have Vladimir Putin uh, representing the common people, you might say, and the Russian Orthodox head honcho. And they're walking together to lay wreaths at this new statue. And so Russia today has got another Saint Vladimir, Saint Vladimir Putin. And the Bible says that he will be, not he in Putin, but Gog will be Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And he is the first Kremlin leader since the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution to publicly profess in the Orthodox Church. On the bottom left hand cartoon, You've got a picture there of a Russian Orthodox priest throwing overboard all the trimmings and trappings that are associated with the Russian Orthodox religion, you know, the incense and whatever he's got. We don't want that. The Russian Orthodox Church is hand in glove with the Soviet, sorry, the Russian government in furthering their mutual causes. And what an incredible photo there on the bottom right. Russian soldiers line up to kiss an icon, not of a religious leader, to kiss an icon of Vladimir Putin. So there will be a religious dimension, I say, to the invasion of Israel. In the prophecy of Joel, we have these words. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for a holy war. Call out the warriors. Let all these fighting men approach and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I too am a warrior. But I want you to notice particularly that quote in yellow, prepare for a holy war. Why a holy war? Now I suggest, brothers and sisters and friends, it's this. Russia is now fairly and squarely right back in the days of the Tsars. It is a Christian country. It has a Christian ruler in President Putin. Vladimir Putin is anxious to be on, on closest terms possible with the religious hierarchy in Russia. And when it comes to the time for Russia and her cohorts to invade the Middle East, what is the church going to say? They're going to say to Mr Putin, look, we don't care what you do to Israel, we don't care what you do to the Jewish people, but we want you to make sure that the holy places in Jerusalem in particular, which, is, which are owned by the Russian Orthodox Church, we want you to make sure that those sites are preserved. And I, I think that this quotation here from Joel is an absolute wizard. Prepare for a holy war. Of course it's going to be a holy war because it's going to be a war that is going to be promoted by military forces in cahoots with religious. Now we come to Israel. And at the moment, surprisingly, Israel is on good terms with Mr Putin and Russia. But what does the Bible say? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely 
shalt thou not know it? So the Bible is describing for us in Ezekiel 38 that, that Israel will be caught off guard. Just when Israel thinks that everything is going swimmingly, they're on good terms with Mr Putin, things are quietening down to some extent um, amongst their neighbours, perhaps there will be this peaceful settlement in Syria, and Israel can sit back and think, you know, we've never had it so good. And then suddenly we find there is this lightning invasion that comes from Gog in the north. Do you remember Haman in the book of Esther? He thought an evil thought, and this, this uh, translation is from the Wycliffe version. Agag, or Haman of Agag, the enemy and adversary of the Jews, thought evil against the Jews. And that's exactly what Russia is going to do. Ezekiel 38 tells us that Gog thinks an evil thought. Thou shalt think an evil thought. You want to go into Israel to take a spoil and to take a prey. So Russia, what's going to happen? Well, we know the end result. We just don't know necessarily, brothers and sisters, how it's all going to come about. But, you know, we see Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes. And this comment um, from the Interpreter magazine by a Russian expert, he said, deceit is standard operating procedure for Vladimir Putin. By the time the international community, meaning USA, Great Britain, Sheba and Dedan, etc., reach the conclusion that you lied to us, you and your allies will be so far ahead of the game that it will not matter. Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38, both portray a very swift invasion of Israel. And suddenly, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish being caught off guard will say, what's going on? Why have you come down here? Why have you come to grab a spoil? That they're, they're sort of taken off guard. And it's because of the deceit of the Gog and his cohorts. Brother Thomas had this to say. When therefore the Tsar gets possession of Constantinople, the capital of Turkey, he will not be hostile to the Pope. On the contrary, he will honour and acknowledge him and be the enemy of the Holy Land. We wait to see the invasion of Turkey. And brothers and sisters, when I say we wait to see... We may already be in the company of our Lord if we are found worthy because the return of our Lord is so soon that we could be called away for judgment and uh, receive our reward, hopefully, of everlasting life. Before this event takes place, the invasion of... We're talking about the invasion of uh, Israel by Gog and his forces. Exactly, we see the same in Revelation 16 where we have Armageddon... Uh, meaning a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And it's not just going to be a few nations. Yahweh says, I will also gather all nations. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And we all know what a storm is like, particularly when you live in Melbourne. You know, it just builds and builds up and then a massive amount of rain falls. We hardly ever get that in Adelaide. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Now one thing I'd just like to leave you with today, this is not the last slide, but I just want to leave with you with this thought. Why is it that God allows Gog and his forces to invade Israel? Brothers and sisters, we haven't got all the answers, but one thing is for sure. You know, Israel is a proud nation. But do you know the other thing? By and large, they are a godless nation. Yes, technically speaking, they may believe in the Old Testament. And they may have religious people there. But in many respects, the nation of Israel has to go through a time of trial because of her iniquity. And that is exactly what we read in Ezekiel 39. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Now, after the invasion by Gog, will I have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous of my holy name. And I thought as an indicative subject as to the iniquity of Israel. Do you know that Israel is now considered to be the gay capital of the world? And Tel Aviv 
is noted to be the world's best gay city. And what a tragedy it is that we can look at that photo there and it's entitled The Holy Land. The Holy Land. And yet Israel is known all around the world as the gay capital. Well, it's no wonder we read in Ezekiel that Israel is to be punished for her iniquities. But on the other hand, who is also going to be punished eternally? And that is the mighty army of Gog and their associates. I'm taking this quote from Isaiah, which refers to the Assyrian invasion, but Assyria is just the Old Testament equivalent of Gog in, the new t in, in our time. This very day, says Isaiah, he, that is the Assyrian or Gog, will halt at no knob. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. And when it would appear as though all is lost and the nation of Israel is on the verge of being destroyed for all time, it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord Yahweh. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Now remember we started off the talk by referring to Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the end of the Roman, end of the Babylonian Empire in uh, 580, sorry, 536 BC when the Persian forces took over. And it was shown to be weighed in the balances and found wanting. And the finger of God moved against the wall and wrote those words out to say that Babylon's days of glory were over. And brothers and sisters, the same thing is going to happen to Gog. The finger of God will decide the destiny of Russia and Europe. And if we could picture it in our mind, the finger of God writing against the wall in Moscow, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And it shall come to pass in that day, says Yahweh, that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog in all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. Back in the 50s, just briefly, the leader of Russia was Premier uh, Nikita Khrushchev, and he, he made a visit to the United States. And amongst other things, he said in a great fit of, you might say, pride and anger, he thumped the lectern and said, we will bury you, saying that was going to happen to capitalism and the Western society. And Brother Perce Mansfield at the time put out a herald and the title of the herald was God will bury Russia in Israel in response to Nikita Khrushchev. And Ezekiel 39 tells us, I will give in the land to Gog a place of graves. God will bury Russia and Israel. So, brothers and sisters, I think we can see from the scriptures how we are wonderfully blessed by the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. And prophecy is, is but the mould. It's all, all set out in advance. And history is poured into that mould. And everything is coming to pass exactly as the word of God said. So for us, we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. So I thank you for maintaining your interest during the break. And uh, I still think the next session starts in five minutes. So I've given you another five minutes break. So that's fantastic. Thank you. So if the chairman wants to come up and tell us what's happening.